All right, here we go. This entire setup is all t is remotely controlled apparently. There's nobody running it. They've got a command center back in the back in the other room. Right, right. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Hello, I'm Ken Bingham and this talk is about how my home lab works differently. So it's got a few characteristics that I'll get into that are maybe a little bit unusual, but uh, a little bit about me. I'm old enough to have grown up with an Apple II and did about 10 years as a sysadmin and then about five years as a cloud engineer, whatever that means. And now I call myself a developer experience engineer, whatever that means. I'm enthusiastic about automation. I've definitely got a defensive security bent. So I guess that's manifest paranoia. And I'd like to little know a little bit about who's in the room here as well. So a quick poll. Who has some experience with self-hosting already? You've got some hardware at home or a VPS and you run some of your own stuff and it replaces some of the SaaS in your life. Okay, that's actually most of the room for the people on the stream. I'd say about 80%. And uh, who would describe themselves instead as self-hosting curious? <laughs> and that's the rest of everybody, okay, cool. So if you guys in the back can't hear me, uh, just come up a little bit because there's no PA in the room. And uh, you know, just give me a signal if you if you can't hear me at all, and you've already moved up to the front of the room, or if uh, if it's time to get off the stage. So this is a new talk. I haven't given this talk before, so it's definitely it, this is definitely for you if you want to uh, try on something, try out something new, and uh, let me know in the hallway or right after the talk what stuck out to you, if anything, because I definitely want to make it better. So my, my highest hope here is that it sparks some conversations with people about self-hosting, the virtues of self-hosting, the methods of self-hosting, that is the why and the how. And I'd love to hear about your lab. Most of you are running something, so let me know what, what you're running and why. And uh, probably the thing that really finally got me into self-hosting is just that I kept hearing I, I subscribed to the subreddit uh, self-hosted, and I just kept hearing about all the great software that's available, and just how good the apps have become, that I felt like I was missing out. So it's just totally just FOMO for me to finally get into it. So by now, you've definitely had your coffee, and I wanted to talk to you about this because it, it has become so accessible and so powerful and it's really a great time. It's an exciting time to be, to be getting into self-hosting if you are actually looking to uh, pick it up again. So I know that the most of the room is already an experienced self-hoster, so you're probably not wondering why should I care. But let's just uh, cover some of the, some of the why, uh, just to recap. And while I'm up here, I'm going to cover some of the why, some of the what, Probably not the who or the where, a little bit of the where. And we'll, at the very end, we'll get into a little bit of the, of the, the future as I see it for self-hosting because really, like I, like I implied, I feel like it's an exciting time. I feel like we're at an inflection point and that some really interesting stuff is happening with cloud tech that uh, could really change the game for us. Like, let us do more of the stuff that we do today with SaaS with self-hosting. So what am I actually hosting? I'll just get this out of the way right now. It's not super sophisticated. It's pretty simple because I haven't been doing this all that long. 
but basically I've got a start page that I'm hosting with Flame that, that links over to a media server running Jellyfin, which is kind of like an open source, totally free Plex, and then a file server with own cloud is what I have so far, and I'm about to add a whole bunch of different node software uh, as I get into uh, th things like uh, proof of stake kind of blockchain stuff. But we're not going to be talking about blockchain here today. So this is just a quick view of what the three different apps look like. You can see on the left there is the start page. Now I picked Flame because it has a, a Docker integration that notices labels on Docker containers. So I didn't even have to write any text files, any configuration files for Flame on the left there. It just automatically notices the apps that you have available running in that particular Docker API and populates the launch pad. And then at the top right is Jellyfin. It's pretty self-explanatory. You get your different categories and libraries of, of different things. And it's nice to actually have both a media server and a file server because the media server gives you a, a very immediate experiential way of exploring your media. It remembers where you were in the playback and it indexes and makes everything searchable and very visual, so that's nice. And I found that myself experiencing my libraries of my collections of media differently because of the way the software is. And then the file server is based, the own cloud file server works a lot like Google Drive, only self-hosted. So that's a little bit about what I'm actually hosting and why. But let's go a little bit deeper into, into the why. Those are some, a little bit about why I picked the things that I picked, but now I'll get into just like the general ethos of it. So um, there's already great SaaS for this stuff, but, and I've always liked the, the idea of self-hosting. And also I work on an open source project in my day job called OpenZD with NetFoundry. And they have a networking, it's a networking framework. And it got me thinking this would be really good for self-hosting. So that kind of pushed me over the edge as well. And uh, one of the things that really interests me on the privacy and security angle is the federation of self-hosted software. So we start talking, we've, this is affectionately referred to as the Fediverse. Anybody heard about the Fediverse? Things like Matrix and Mastodon and things like that. So I think that's just a really interesting angle, really, in the, in the way that it can democratize access to the, the capabilities that those platforms represent. So I started to develop this belief that there's pretty much an app for everything, or there very soon could be if we just put some weight behind the self-hosting idea. And I really wanted to commit some of my own resources and time and attention to that, to, you know, if it basically, put another way, if it can happen, I want it to happen. I want to make sure that I'm a part of it. And I wanted to play with all the new toys, like I said earlier, about the fear of missing out on all these cool apps that were becoming available. I knew that I would gain some valuable experience doing this for myself and just uh, building, on the, building on what I've learned so far, uh, doing cloud engineering, I found it pretty easy to get up and running with a Linode and some Docker, right? Pretty easy. And if that doesn't sound easy to you, I would be happy to introduce the, the concepts and help you get started as well if that was interesting to you. So um, one of the other motivations for me is that I'm definitely a documentarian. I'm usually the guy in the room with a camera snapping pictures and I'm always the guy right after the event who's sharing album links <laughs> with everybody so that they can see all this stuff. And uh, if you can relate to that, then yeah, you know what I mean. So I've got a pretty huge collection of various kinds of media and I have a pretty big family and they're usually pretty open to my uh, uh, ideas for this kind of thing. So I figured I could not only share my collection with everyone, but also as a stretch goal, get them sharing their stuff back with the rest of us. So that's a little bit more of a commitment of infrastructure, but the possibility is kind of a beautiful one where we can all have our own private cloud together and share all this stuff. So it actually gave me an audience. It's not just 
me uh, talking to myself in a room. I've got a, I'm, I'm one of nine children, so there have got a few, a few different people in the, in the family that I can, we can share photos, and there's an obvious uh, benefit there. Okay, so I want to clarify something about the how. I ran out of room in the synopsis that I sent in with my talk proposal where I said, no firewalls. That is absolutely not true. There are firewalls, but the what I'm trying to say there is that there are no firewall exceptions. And that's one of the things that's special about the network is that normally when you would run a home server, you will have some firewall exceptions in your edge to allow incoming server ports to be reachable. So in addition to there being no firewall exceptions, there are no server ports at all that are listening on any network, except for 127-8. So loopback only servers. This was just a design requirement. Since I knew that it was possible because I work on this open source project that makes it possible, I made that a design requirement. No exceptions. There can be no servers at any point listening to any network except 127-8. So that means Alice and Bob can't talk to my server, and neither can Mallory. So the other requirement for this is that all communications between any part of the network are conducted overlay. And I'll define what I mean by that. It's the difference between using identities, cryptographically secure, that is cryptographically verifiable identities, for every communication on the network, as opposed to addresses. And this commoditizes the, 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 the relationship to the network between the application. So it's very simple. You just need to have a TCP socket, and the rest is taken care of in software. There's no network configuration, per se, that is required for the network to function. That is the application, the distributed application to function. So my, my vision for this involves pre-configuring and placing Raspi nodes along with some external storage at several family members' homes. Haven't gotten to that point yet. But you can see what I mean. I think it's fair to say that it's going to be a distributed system pretty soon. At this point, just one node. So I was actually hoping that I would have this implemented as a full home server by today, but uh, Aaron Honeycutt, are you in the room? No, he's not here. Okay. So he works for System76. I was really hoping he could bring my new desktop with him today. That would have been nice. I live in Charlotte, so I could have taken it home. Too bad. I, I guess it's already in the mail. But anyway, Linode is great too, and I was went ahead and just set everything up on a Linode. Uh, anybody not know about Linode? I'd be happy to tell you about it. It's fantastic. Glad that they exist. That's another thing that I really want to exist is inexpensive Linux VPS and much more than that too. So um, I went ahead and did that. And the first thing I did was to install the open source agent that I work on called OpenZD. And this is going to function kind of like a VPN. But it's, it's an agent, it's a tunneler, and I installed that, and then I turned off uh, ex public internet access to the SSH server. That was the first thing I did was start checking off those boxes. There can be no listening servers, so now I'm using SSH over ZD instead of the internet. So I turned on the Linode Cloud Firewall just to block all incoming ports. And if anything goes wrong and I need to get back in, I'll just turn make, a, make an exception in the firewall, but I haven't had to do that yet. Continuing on the how, the applications, like I said, are running in Docker containers on a VPS, and the data is persisted in Docker volumes or on the file system there. And then I that's the application data, and then the user data is persisted in store J, which is a which is formerly known as Tardigrade. It's an S3 compatible backend. So the own cloud server actually has a configuration option that uses an S3 compatible API as its primary storage. So even though it's a lightweight container running on a lightweight VPS in the cloud, in my private cloud, this, 
the the gigabytes and terabytes of storage are actually in an S3 backend that's mounted as an object store on the own cloud container. Mounted usually m refers to file systems. I didn't mean to imply file system. It is, a, it is an S3 object store. And like I said, the, on the Linode, there are 127 slash 8 listeners for the ports that are being exposed by the containers. And those, those, those exposures do not extend beyond that host itself. So how do I share this enclave of data with friends and family? It's a three-step process. First, I go to the web console and create their identity. That's an individual identity for them. It's basically a single-use token and a placeholder for assigning permissions. Then I need to transmit that to them, either as an email with an attached token file or show them the QR code that's generated by the app. And then they load that in their agent, and that configures their device for impertuity to be able to access anything for which they're authorized. And this is what we call in the OpenZD project, uh, quote, host access, because we've configured devices to talk to devices. And essentially, that makes that device a thing on the network. And any user or process running on that device has the same level of access, because we've configured the operating system to have DNS and IP routes for just those services that they are authorized to use. So I'll explain a, a little bit more about what I meant by underlay and where this software layer fits in. The gray underlay would be layer three and up. And then every, ZD exists in the application layer. What I'm calling an overlay is essentially software running in layer seven of the OSI model presenting you c it's presenting TLS certificates you know, as a barrier to entry for anything to talk to the overlay itself. And then the overlay is a, is a kind of encapsulation. And so then you can build your distributed infrastructure on top of that. And then you can build apps, deploy apps on your distributed infrastructure. So its primary function, that is the overlay, at least in the sense that it's used, at, at least in the sense that the word overlay is used by the project that I work on, and my overlay of choice, is to form reverse TCP tunnels on demand whenever an application is authorized. And so it's for that reason that the overlay itself, too, does not have any servers, any application servers that are bare, naked, exposed to the internet in that way. All communication is barred by a TLS challenge. So you must have a client certificate in order to participate in the overlay. And only then, if you're authorized, would you be able to co connect to the applications that are deployed on the overlay. So hopefully that makes it clear why there are no firewall exceptions at all for any servers that are part of the private cloud. Now, going beyond host access to app level access means that we can shrink that attack service down even more. If we're using a VPN, then we've, we've removed ourselves from the internet and we've created virtual user networks, virtual machine networks, that are like zones. You could call that zone-based access control. Yeah, and yet, with, a, with greater sophistication, you can slice and dice that up to, bring, to shrink that perimeter down even more. I just described for you host-based access control, which means that a particular device has loopback listeners if it's a server, and multiple users can use the same services if that device is configured. The, the future that, that I see involves shrinking that perimeter even more so that the application itself is 
has on board all of its networking connectivity machinery. And that's really interesting because now there's not even a loopback listener for a server. The process is listening, is forming its own TCP reverse tunnel out from itself, and there's no server at all on any network. And that means not only is it not scannable, not attackable on any network, but it's also completely portable. It can run anywhere. It can be lifted and shifted to the other side of the world as long as light speed allows it. And that application becomes completely portable. And I think that this may open up some really interesting shared hosting scenarios. Because right now, the paradigm of network security that we have is based on network security, which the only kind of network security is isolation. Networks are designed to convey packets, not to restrict the conveyance of packets. So any kind of impedance that you introduce in a network to try to inspect the packets and infer whether they're legitimate or not is essentially, it, it, you're, 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 you've got your work cut out for you. It's a, it's a challenge to know whether or not a packet is what it's supposed to be and whether it's going where it's supposed to go. So if we change that paradigm to focus on identities that are allowed to communicate rather than addresses, then we have the possibility of, I could, I could confidently allow you to deploy any amount of application using any, any resources that we negotiated on my servers, and I wouldn't be worried that you could somehow attack me. So the hosting sharing is just one dimension of, of how I think this is uh, changing for the better. And I am going to talk about that side of it a little bit more in another talk tomorrow, if you look at the schedule. So it remains to be seen if overlays are the future of networking. But they do think, I do think that they make a really compelling case, especially uh, they've definitely been enabling for me to make uh, fewer compromises as I put together the self-hosting lab. Yes, I'm really interested to know what ideas this raises for you. Thank you very much. So we do have a microphone up here, and I'm guessing that it's good for questions for the PA, which does not exist. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask right now, then I'll just go ahead and repeat it back for the stream. Yes, Richard. Right. 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 Correct. So Richard is asking whether OpenZD in particular, when we're using this host-based access control approach, which is one of three approaches, uh, to achieving a, a, a maybe a zero trust network or you make creating an overlay network, a logical uh, layer uh, for your network, whether there would be competition between different overlays. I think I can imagine, I, I can certainly run multiple OpenZD networks in tandem on the same device. There's no competition there. As long as the, as long as it's possible to describe how those interests, how those concerns should be separated. So the most common way of separating those concerns at the host level would be search domains for your DNS corresponding IP routes. So although it is possible with host, control, host access to create services that are known by an IP address where there's a strong coupling between an IP address and an identity, just like WireGuard, 
that isn't what I would normally advise because you can do, there, there are obvious benefits, I think, to using identifiers, logical identifiers, meaningful identifiers, like a domain name. Um, or if you're moving into the application space, then you're using a verifiable identifier to address all of your traffic, not an IP address and not even a domain name. So a little bit more specifically, you could have two different search domains for two different concerns running on the same device. And if the DNS query for the name server that's being provided by those respective overlays were ha happened to resolve for one of those two search domains, then it would find an IP address for which there are discrete routes for the correct overlay. And there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any competition there. Yes, sir. The question is whether the, the, the mechanism of the reverse TCP tunnel requires something like a stun or turn server to rendezvous on a routable IP. Yes, this particular method does use a rendezvous. It's, we call them edge routers. So these edge routers are listening on the internet with a TCP, sorry, a, a TCP socket that is, requires a client certificate. So they must be pre-enrolled before they, those connections can succeed. Well, when I, um, when I, what I did was I used the NetFoundry Teams plan, which is the free forever tier of NetFoundry. NetFoundry is uh, managed ZD. So I just click to, it, click to create my fabric, click to create my edge, and now I have a rendezvous that's dedicated to me. And I can deploy my endpoints, my VPS, whatever I want for my applications. And they always have a reliable rendezvous available to create those outgoing connections from the stuff that I'm trying to protect. You're welcome. You do, yeah. You can self-host any part of it. You can self-host the entire stack there. We have little uh, quick starts and stuff for that, yeah. Yes, it's 100% open source. Yes, sir. Yes, the, the NetFoundry is hosting my controller, and the controller, that is the ZD controller, is one of the three main components of my network. There are routers, there are controllers, and then there are endpoints like my mobile or my laptop. And the controller has an onboard CA that issues the certificates that are necessary to um, pass the TLS challenge to use the fabric. And if I want to bring my own CA, I can. And that doesn't, that doesn't it, it's, all, it's all free. So I can, I can use OpenSSL and create a key and create a, uh, create a self-signed uh, a root CA and then uh, associate that with my free network and then issue endpoints all day long and they'll be honored. Yep. Well, thanks for all the great questions and uh, feel free to grab me if you think of any more. Thanks everybody. <laughs>